Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Yusuf Jamal Aldin, Bloomberg. Sayyidati Sadati, Rahibu Mari Bi Yusuf Jamal Aldin, Min Bloomberg. Mic's on, there we go, and now I feel at home. Adiyuf al-Karam, Ashab al-Ma'ali wa Sa'ada, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, it's a privilege to be here today. And this is going to be one of the most interesting panel discussions of the Financial Sector Conference. Saudi Arabia is on the train, on the fast track train to reform, more reform. And part of that is financing innovation and innovating finance. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and about the opportunities that brings with it. Of course, Saudi Aramco recently set the tone with a $12 billion bond issuance that underscores that the kingdom is hungry to get out there and reestablish itself and firm up as a global energy champion. Who better to get on stage to run through some of those bigger ideas than the energy minister himself? Please, a warm welcome for Mr. Khalid Al-Falah. We're uh, over there, apparently, all the way in the corner. Yeah. So I'll be on, on the outside here, and it's right here. We're in the economy section. Here. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> they they put the, the two chairs quite close together. I know you like to keep your distance a little bit. No, from no, me, not so true. This is a probably a bit of a, a bit of a relief. Uh, Minister, thank you very much for, for the time. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, I'll get straight to it. There's, there's no two way about it in terms of the changes that are happening in the kingdom and the recent bond issuance. Uh, a lot of the investors that I've been speaking to here at the event and, and through Bloomberg TV over, over the last few weeks, they want to know, is there more to come of that in terms of bond issuances, in terms of diversifying your, your sources of capital? Kingdom General or, or Saudi Aramco? Saudi Aramco and the Kingdom in general, in both, in both cases? Well, I, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, I think what we've started in the Kingdom, whether it's uh, the Ministry of Finance with, uh, with, with an excellent program managed by the Debt Management Office, uh, followed by other uh, government-owned entities, is a methodical program that will take time, that will access capital. Uh, both domestically and internationally, and we've seen the, the, the inaugural uh, bond uh, program for Aramco, and I think it's, uh, in fact, I know for sure it's only the beginning of, of a continuation of accessing uh, different classes of capital. Uh, and not only does it diversify sources of funds, for the entities involved, the sovereign, the Ministry of Finance, the Treasury, and, and all the program that it intends to, uh, to fund over the next uh, 10 years and beyond to achieve the 2030 targets, but also the enterprises uh, within the kingdom. You mentioned Aramco as an example, but it's not the only one. It's no secret that Saudi Arabia has the capabilities in these institutions and in the people that lead them to be uh, global globally leading uh, companies yeah. in many sectors. The oil and gas, of course, is the obvious one, but uh, Sabic and chemicals, Maad and in mining, STC and others, uh, and telecom, and, and just like globally leading companies, these enterprises will, of course, uh, seek and have access uh, to, uh, to, to sources of capital. But at the same time, this will allow um, intermediation uh, for investors. We've, uh, of course, uh, seen that uh, in the kingdom. Traditionally, our uh, stock market has been, uh, has, has been a, a good destination for savings in the kingdom. Yeah. Today, uh, Saudi investors and, and savers can access sukuks, bonds, and, and commercial paper, and derivatives are, of course, coming in into, into the capital market. Yeah. So it's a win-win, win for investors um, and companies uh, as well. I mean, Saudi Aramco is in the limelight at the moment, so I, I want, to, I want to, to get you to weigh in on, on a couple of elements of that. 
for the bond issuances, do you have a when and how much yet in terms of how deep that program could go? Uh, well, Aramco, of course, after the SABIC uh, acquisition is consummated, uh, we hope uh, by the end of this year, will become not only the largest oil and gas company by a large uh, margin, but will also, uh, with, with the combined businesses of the two companies and, and the portfolio of the company, and of course what it's building, both domestically and globally, will be the largest downstream company, refining, uh, and petrochemical. So its capital base is going to grow. I think it's, uh, it's the, 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 the balance sheet will have an appropriate level of debt, and you've seen the balance sheet, it's huge. So if even, even if Saudi Aramco stays on the low end of gearing amongst its peers, it still has the capacity to, to uh, offer uh, a lot of debt instruments going forward. Mm -hmm. So what I can tell you for sure is that the 12 billion we just raised is only the beginning. It's certainly not the end. It establishes uh, Aramco's presence in the market and, and so it sounds to me like there could be another 12 billion. Uh, they, they will be more. I will not tell you what and when, and they may not be bonds only. So I think Aramco will be active uh, in, 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 uh, in the bond markets and in the debt markets. And following this, what I also want to say uh, is Aramco will sooner than you think will be uh, accessing uh, the equity markets in terms of the IPO. That's going to come um, as, as soon as, as, as we're uh, ready and the markets are ready, as I've said many times. Uh, but now, now that the company has been exposed, now that the investors have reacted so enthusiastically to, uh, to, the, to the company and know its quality, we've seen the reserves, we've seen, we've seen the financials, we've seen the qualitative aspects of Aramco yeah. in terms of its uh, environmental performance, safety performance, uh, human capital uh, capability, technology, all of this has been um, exposed and, and, and documented in the prospectus for the bonds. It will be exposed even more in the equity prospectus to come um, in, in the not too distant future. So yeah. stay in, tuned. So let me briefly follow up on that. So in 2021, is that still a tentative date for the flotation? Well, that's that's announced date. It could it could slip a little bit, it could come forward a little bit. I think, I think the focus now that we've done the bonds is, uh, is, is to go through the necessary regulatory steps to close the Aramco, the Aramco SABIC uh, PIF transaction. We hope that will be uh, quick. But once we do that and the financials are consolidated and exposed to the investors, essentially all of the preparatory steps for the IPO have been taken, by bo both by the government and by the company. Yeah. So I think we'll be, we'll be able to hit the ground running once we close on SABIC. Uh, let's talk a little bit about innovation because the kingdom is trying to push forward maybe a little bit away from adaptation and in imitation and more into cutting edge. Uh, how do you see that evolution progressing over the next, years, next few years? What's possible? Well, it will, happen, it will happen on multiple tracks uh, and, and in different ways. At the macro level, of course, you've seen the bold um, and, and decisive action taken by the PIF, uh, with, with not only with, uh, with, uh, with the SoftBank Vision Fund, uh, and, and essentially changing the global landscape on uh, on, on uh, how uh, technology uh, acquisitions uh, are done and uh, leapfrogging forward and, and the PIF now is probably the, the world's leading technology investor uh, as, you, uh, as you look around. We've also seen the PIF invest on its own with Uber, uh, Lucid and other investments that, that uh, they, have, uh, they have done. That's, uh, that's definitely a signal for the rest of us uh, within the economy. Uh, Saudi Aramco for a number of years have been also um, in the technology, M&A, venture capital space. Uh, more than five years ago, the company uh, established the Saudi Aramco Energy Ventures with about $500 million, more than 40 uh, companies have been invested in, and some of them have the potential to be unicorns. 
and change the landscape in a number of sectors that, that Saudi Aramco is interested in. And it's not just oil and gas, it's chemicals, it's uh, technologies that, that even are in the peripheral of, uh, of uh, the, energy, uh, the energy space. Uh, Sabic and others uh, are doing the same. Within the kingdom, we've invested big in, uh, in, in um, technology, of course, KAUST is the flagship uh, investment by the kingdom in, in research and technology uh, and innovation. A number of venture capital inward looking uh, investments and initiatives have taken place. Yeah. Uh, Aramco has wide, uh, uh, the King Abdulaziz City of Science and Technology have both Taqnia, which is owned by the PIF and managed by the city but they also have Badr, which is, which is a venture program and an incubator. Talking about incubators, there are a number of incubators in the kingdom. Having said all of this, we recognize that when it comes to technology and innovation, the ecosystem is, uh, is not complete yet, and it has a lot of potential. Yeah. In the previous panel, there was a lot of discussion about skills and capabilities and the young people in Saudi Arabia and what they can do. And I can tell you from close interface with them, they have a huge potential to, uh, to create, to innovate, to deliver value to not only the Saudi economy, but to the global economy. We've seen one of them, for example, participate in Kareem, mm -hmm. which is a regional success. It is the biggest uh, venture uh, success uh, and a startup uh, in the kingdom. And what I can promise is, is that there will be many, many Kareems in areas like FinTech, and we just saw one uh, company in FinTech being listed uh, here in the kingdom. There will be many of those, and I think the universities, the technology hubs, the incubators, and the young people, if they are sponsored by people uh, like, like we have in this conference in terms of uh, having belief in them, investing in them, creating the investment vehicle, the venture capital uh, vehicle, I think we will see amazing things. So it, the kingdom is a big investor in oil and gas globally and is now more of an emerging investor in technology. What's next on your shopping list, given that you have more financial tools, more financial leverage to, to work with? Well, I think both, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at uh, energy, uh, you, you, we can talk about both Aramco and Saab. Uh, and they're both globally leading within, within their businesses. They look, uh, they look at the world uh, as, uh, as their market, uh, and they intend to capture uh, every uh, profitable opportunity uh, in the world. Most of those are going to be uh, around uh, growing markets, uh, not only in Asia, but Africa, uh, some in uh, Central Asia and, and Eastern Europe where markets may be underserved. And some investments will be after resources that may not be available here. Uh, so both uh, Sabic and Aramco will be looking to places where gas is, for example. We believe that gas will be growing faster than oil. Uh, and there are plentiful mm -hmm. of, uh, of gas resources. So Aramco is investing and in negotiations uh, around the world, including the Arctic with, uh, with, with Russian uh, companies, including in Australia, uh, including in the US, where the shale gas and the shale oil revolution has made a lot of resources available. Sabic, likewise, is looking to invest in China, looking to invest in India, uh, and looking to invest in the US, where, where the feedstock uh, is available. Both companies have had discussions around the case, Caspian, and Aramco has been uh, also looking uh, at Africa. So all of these opportunities are in different stages uh, of maturity, uh, but they will be, uh, uh, I, I predict, uh, potentially, if you look in, in, in the 10 to 20 year time frame, there will be hundreds of billions of dollars of Saudi investment that is outward looking, mm -hmm. and a lot of it will be in the energy and the chemical space. Minister, it would be, well, let me put it this way. I wouldn't be a newsman if I didn't get you to, uh, 
talk a little bit about what's happening in the energy markets. The reality is that the price of oil has a massive impact on what's happening with finance in the Gulf and in Saudi Arabia in particular. We had the developments in the last 48 hours where the waivers for countries that are dealing with Iran were not renewed. Uh, you've already put out a statement, I know, but I'd like you to just share a few ideas about where you see the oil market at the moment, given this latest development, and where that leaves the, the OPEC plus um, approach to it. Yeah. Yusuf, let me, let me first, I think, step back uh, and reflect. You mentioned that the oil markets and prices are, uh, have a high impact on the finances of countries like Saudi Arabia. Let me, let me just recognize and salute His Excellency Minister of Finance. Uh, we just saw the announcements and, and the numbers on the first quarter. And I will remind you that the first quarter uh, experienced, and of course it followed also the fourth quarter, this was uh, quite a downturn, a sudden one, unexpected one by, by all accounts in terms of how the global energy markets uh, behaved. Uh, and it was uh, a confluence of many factors. There were geoeconomic, geopolitical factors, and of course, uh, as well as oil market fundamentals when inventories reversed course and started rising uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. Yet, despite oil prices going from 86 to 49, the kingdom achieved a surplus last year, and we saw the fantastic performance of, uh, of, of our uh, treasury and how we managed our finances and how His Excellency, with a combination of prudent spending, but also uh, how he is raising uh, non-oil revenues uh, for, for the treasury, is able to weather that storm quite comfortably. I will also tell you that, that as a policy, uh, we, we, we don't react to prices on short-term basis. We remain focused as, as, as a nation, as an oil policy, on balancing global markets. And equal to our interest as a nation is our interest in uh, the stability and the continued growth of the global economy. So last year when oil prices spiked after the announcement of the sanctions and, and, and the anxiety that, that set on in the global economy, I can tell you that I was on more, <laughs> under more pressure than I was when oil prices pierced the $50 going down and people were concerned uh, unnecessarily about, about us being able to, uh, to balance our budget and keep our finances straight within, within the kingdom. Today, as all of the variables you mentioned uh, are under scrutiny, what guides my uh, actions and, and what I do is looking at the fundamentals of the oil market. And, and the primary indicator that I look at is, uh, is global oil inventories. And as you've seen, uh, you're, you're an astute watcher of oil market fundamentals, uh, inventories uh, actually are continuing to rise despite what's happening in Venezuela, despite the tightening uh, sanctions on, uh, on Iran. So I don't see the need to do anything, uh, any, anything uh, immediately. We're uh, talking to our customers, we're watching inventories, we're, uh, we're, we're going to be talking to other producers, as I mentioned in, um, in my statement. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we will have a joint uh, ministerial monitoring committee in Jeddah. Uh, and many ministers have already reached out to me, and I've reached out to a number of them yesterday uh, after putting out our statement. And, and, and we're all in dialogue. They will be in Jeddah. We will decide what we're going to do beyond June. I think the sentiment in general uh, is that we, uh, as oil producers, should never uh, lift our hands off the wheel global markets in general, but oil markets in particular are very fragile, uh, and we have to, we have to always uh, keep our hands on the wheel and keep supply and demand closely, uh, closely uh, you know, matched so that we don't end up in any severe shortages, and certainly we will not, we will not get caught up uh, where we uh, got surprised uh, in the fourth quarter last year with an, with an inventory build. Uh, but in the meantime, my last word is we will not leave our customers scrambling, not finding the oil they need. And I think we can balance all of those. It's not an easy job, but we'll make sure the oil markets globally, at a global level, remain balanced 
and we will make sure the customers and those who uh, who uh, want to replace Iranian oils, uh, they uh, they know which number to dial, and we're ready for them. Minister, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for sharing those ideas. Uh, of course, a big thank you to the audience as well for being patient and attentive. And of course, to round it all up, a big round of applause for Minister Khalid Feleh. <laughs>